Hello, book lovers. It is Phil Svitek and Marissa Serafini back for another book discussion today. William Gibson's All Tomorrow's Parties. It is the book that is on the docket. Um, and before, uh, just for a little bit of context for people, you know, if you're brand new, each month we pick a book, we read the book, and we talk about the book. So we... In, in essence, assume that you've read the book, but it's okay if you haven't and you want to just listen to us. Hey, I'm not going to fault you. Um, uh, and we also invite you to join in on the discussion. You know, comment down below. Let us know your thoughts on, on the stuff that we've read. And also let us know if you have suggestions for the future. Uh, we want to make this a nice little virtual book club. So it's not just Marissa and I, but Marissa and I and you. So... Um, let's start as we always do with quick thoughts on all tomorrow's parties. <laughs> you started with me. Uh, well, I can kick it off if you'd like, whatever, whatever floats your boat. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll have to preface our conversation by saying when you first brought this book up to me and then I talked to you about it and saying that, uh, that this was the third book in a trilogy. Do I need to read the first two? And you clearly said, no, you don't. And then after reading this book, I thought to myself, uh, yeah, I should have. So I don't want to like fully judge this book considering I haven't read the first two parts of it. So that's where I'm going to go into this conversation. I think I could have enjoyed this book more had I read properly read the first two books. I see. Well, it's, it's called the trilogy... And it borrows characters, but in a sense, it's like, do you need to read all the James, non -bo James Bond novels to understand any James Bond novel that you pick up? Like, that's how it was presented to me, and that's how I understand it. And if anything else, uh, you know, for me, I'm a, like William Gibson, and we'll talk about this when we discuss him as a person, but like, you know, he's very well regarded as a science fiction author. I had read Neuromancer, and I did enjoy that one. Uh, and, you know, the term cyberpunk gets uh, coined with him. So a lot of like, you know, as, as far as sci-fi, you know, he's on the level of like uh, Neil Stevenson, Philip K. Dick and um, uh, Ursula. Yeah, I was going to say, I was like, cyberpunk is associated with him, not Philip K. Dick. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so so in that sense, you know, I was excited to read this. And and, you know, like I said, I mean, I didn't read the first two either. Um, but I, it, it was always told to me, it's like um, also Edgar Wright's Coronado trilogy. Like, it's just the only reason that's even a trilogy is simply because it has an ice cream in each of the movies. Uh, so, you know, I, I thought we could. And, and it doesn't, you know, in reading it, I understood what was happening. But um, this is apparently the most exciting of the trilogy, which doesn't bode well for it because it's not that exciting, unfortunately. If I'm being honest, you know, mm, no, no. And I was talking about it, this book with someone else. And I, I mean, I, I took, I was in and out of this book. Not going to lie. I did a lot of stops. And then I realized I was 180 pages in. And I thought to myself, the only thing that has happened, I have followed the main protagonist from one city to the next. He picked up a package and that's all that happened. <laughs> And I could have taken the same amount of time in real time from Los Angeles to San Francisco and done that and more in real time than it took me to read that part of the book. I'm like, this is real time, very, very slow burn of a book in a point at a point which is not good. Like if you're 100, 180 pages into a book, more stuff should have happened than following a character from one city to the next picking up something. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. So it's speculative fiction as well, right? And I think in many ways, I almost think like it, I would have preferred almost like a, like a nonfiction book as far as like what he was predicting. Because it's, you know, it's, it, 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 in terms of the real world, it's coming up on Y2K, right? The millennia. So like all this change is happening. And so I think he's drawing from that. And that, and that seems to certainly be a theme. Although for him, it's more about nanotechnology, um, and yet we never really get the nanotechnology side either. It's more of, 
like <clears throat> whatever's supposed to happen is just this like, hey, something big's going to happen. We don't know what, but something big is about to happen and it's going to change the course of human history. It's like, okay, that sounds really cool. Can we uh, start to get hints maybe? And by the end of the novel, I mean, I don't know how you felt, but like, I didn't feel like humanity has changed. <laughs> it just kind of ended. No, I don't think so either. And also, you have to remember the time that which we're reading this book, it is at the hopefully quote unquote tail end of a pandemic. And so we're, we're in this barrage of like medicine and vaccinations and injections and all that. So like that's fresh on our, in the forefront of our minds. And then reading this book saying that there's a medical kind of drug out there that's affecting something, it could help the world or it could end it. We're like, oh, great, because currently we're living in a pandemic. So we've seen the end of something. We've seen how big of a world problem could be. So we know like the, the dire stakes in which this is happening. But also reading the end of this book, like you said, nothing changes. And I never really felt all that much jeopardy in the beginning. Yeah, like the stakes are never well defined. I mean, in some sense, they're the biggest stakes, like, hey, the world's about to change. But mm -hmm. again, you have no context for what that is. And at no point do you get that context of, apart from, I mean, if there is an antagonist, it's um, this guy named Harwood, Cody Harwood, who's uh, the head of a PR firm. And he wants to control nanotechnology because that's the latest emergent technology. And and in many ways, it's like indicative of like, especially now, if you look at, let's say, people like Zuckerberg, Bezos, Elon Musk, like they want to be in control of technology, but, but the novel just never really grapples of what that means, you know? Right. And we have definitely seen the, the multimillionaires, multi-billionaires trying to get ahead of something like, uh, you know, we, we definitely have Bezos and musk and buffett and all that in today's time but this book has of course it has hardwood being the the quote-unquote multi-millionaire or person who's trying to be ahead of of the curve in in that sense but also what does he do <laughs> other than bring the topic into discussion and follow he's trying to follow the path but it doesn't really lead us to anywhere because he's not he, he's not the main character. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm like, I was trying to, I understand that he's the one who, who's worried about all, all of it. But yeah, he doesn't really do anything about it. Yeah, I mean, well, he, he is. So his company ultimately, like, they're the ones who now control the, the Lucky Dragon nanotech stuff. Um, and consent. basically, I mean, what, as I understand, what ends up happening is like now you can create, the, you know, if I if I make a notebook, I can nano fax it to you. And now you have a notebook. <laughs> right. And there was that description also. And you can clearly tell this was before the Amazon <laughs> shopping boom, where they're like, if you wanted to have something and give it to someone instead of shipping it overseas, you could just use the company that's already stationed there to build you one and create, and then you can have it also there. But then what do you do with the original? You just keep it. So I was like, mm, I mean, there, there are easier ways to go about it. The technology, sure. The concept of the nanotechnology is like, Hey, you want it too? I can, let me just build it for you. Um, but again, that doesn't go anywhere. It's cool with the, the concept, but it doesn't lead to anything or add anything more to the story. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it, for me, the best way to summarize it would be it asks a lot of questions and it progresses none of them. And, and, and it's, people have this problem sometimes with fantasy novels as well and, you know, sci-fi and whatnot. Anytime you're doing some world building, when you're just like building out the world and the world and the world, it's like, okay, that's great, but something has to happen, you know, like right. you got to make the world building part of that plot. Otherwise you're just, you know, describing things for me. And unfortunately, that's yeah. what it felt like. Right. And I think this is where we did both of us a disservice by not reading the first 
too, because when we jump into this book, it introduces all these characters or all these character names that I don't know who they are other than their names. Their, and we don't, it doesn't describe any of their backgrounds, what their job really is other than their title and what they do, where they come from. And I think that was probably hopefully established in the first two books that I had to, I had a hard time understanding who all the characters were in this one. Not going to lie. I was at least grateful because it kept it moving to some degree. I was like, I don't need to know who they, I was just to do something, <laughs> just do something at this point. You're well, having, I mean, me as a reader, I wanted to know like, okay, here's this person. Why are they there? Where did they come from? Why am I following them? And right now at this point in the third book, I'm just following them, still not understanding who they were, like what and what they did. Um, so I don't know. I, I missed that key element as a reader. Gotcha. Like, if I'm going to devote my time following character, I want to know why. Well, for, I don't think you would have gotten it. Why? You know, I mean, so the, the, the main characters, right? So there's Laney, who's a data analyst. Um, and it's exactly what it sounds like. He's the one who kind of sets this in motion because he, as he sees a pattern that something's going to happen, what he doesn't know, but something is going to happen. That's what sets all this up. Then you have uh, Rydell, who's this like rent a cop, and he was working in LA and he gets hired by Laney to go to San Francisco to observe. That's basically his job. And then this girl named Chevette, who's also kind of Rydell's ex-girlfriend, uh, she's running from another ex-boyfriend, and it leads her to San Francisco along with her roommate, who's a documentarian. Which sounds to way film all this. <laughs> yeah, which sounds way more exciting than it ended up being. <laughs> right, and also I mean, the thing is, is that there are so, so many side characters who are really just observers <laughs> and yet we're, we're still having to follow these side characters that add nothing to the plot yeah like um which i guess in that sense which one frustrated you the most uh boomzilla <laughs> Boom Boom. just and silencio this this i believe a young kid who's just fascinated with watches i'm like okay he's also just a side player. I don't even want to say player, but like he's a side character who's just there taking up space. And so how do you then feel since Silencio, um, he literally ends the book? Like was, I, I mean, I, when I, I was both glad to have ended the book, but I was also like, that's it. That's what happened. He just watches the watch. He watches the watch. I mean, it's very meta for his character, but also, again, it's showing that oh, I think it really would have benefited us if we read the first two to see if Silencio actually had a purpose, <laughs> you know? But, well, he, Silencio is not from the first two, though. Is he not? I wouldn't no. know because I haven't read the first two. So, but the, oh, again, him being there, this is, oh, so, this is where all my confusion lies. There are so many characters in this book. I don't know who's actually adding to the plot or who's not, or who's actually part of the original books that came into this. There, there has to be a, a, a through thread from one to two to three, which is where we are. We're at three. And I'm not sure which ones are important to follow or not. See, I think, I think, I think part of you is giving it way too much credit of like what those books do. So here's context. I'm going to orient you and maybe this will help. Maybe it won't. But again, I think, I think you're like attributing way too much relevance to what those books. So, okay. So it's called the bridge trilogy. Yeah. And uh, the reason why they're called that is because of the San Francisco bridge. So it's comprised of Virtual Light, which was written in 1993, uh, I, I Do Rue, which uh, 1996, and All Tomorrow's Parties, 1999. And then there's also Skinner's Room, which was, uh, you know, just a short story. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, it is set in the imaginary 2006, um, and each book is set later. Uh, the books deal with uh, 
a race to control cyberspace technology um, set in a post-California um, earthquake, right? So you have NoCal and SoCal um, and, you know, building te- nanotechnology. Um, but again, each book is different in terms of how it does that. Um, so, you know, in, in the first one, uh, it has Rydell and Chevette. The second one is about Laney, who has, um, you know, this interaction with the, uh, with the AI pop star that, that we later see as far as, um, you know, what Rydell gets from the package. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's it. That's, yeah, really, that's it. that's literally what kind of happened. Like you had, you know, that's, that's it. I wish there was really more, but as I said, like, um, people praise this book. Um, where is it? Uh, just- I don't know why. And I think that's just me as a reader. I wanted more. So therefore I'm trying to like justify is, are there more layers to any of these characters in which Obviously, the the writer Gibson, you know, thought was important enough to add all these side B characters that that are just that just happen to be there. I mean, that's it. I mean, you know, um, like people they, have written. They a, feel like they should have a bigger purpose. Sadly, they don't. I mean, uh, as is written, the novel significance in the fact that it had several motif, motifs, themes, and characters in common with virtual light and Iridu, but without being sequential. All right. So shifting gears a little bit, let's talk about the theme of nanotech, right? Um, It's this elusive thing that is both now in comic books and comic book movies and certainly sci-fi. And and in many ways, it's like this thing that can do anything, right? It's nanotech. No, you don't need to explain it. It's just nanotech. So I'm curious, you know, in the context of this novel, um, you know, how do you feel about nanotech? I mean, I like it because if you got to remember this book was in what, 99. So I mean, he wrote it late nineties. So by then people, the concept is there, but people still don't understand it. And I think even with the difference of 20, 20 plus years, and you've seen how the technology has grown to actually visualize um, what it looks like for us to under understand it. Um, I think I like to think Gibson was kind of ahead of his time because he was one of the first people who really, like, really tried to dive into it and use it in literary context. Um, I like that the, the whole concept of you know building something from molecules is fascinating because no one, if if you're not into you know uh, like molecular science in that way, there's always that level of uh, ignorance that's and naivety that's um you know fascinating and you're like oh nanotechnology let's talk about it because no one especially in the 90s didn't really uh know what it was so i I think it's cool that he wanted to use that seeing the progression of it i mean you definitely have come uh, a long way with it but i still feel like people even today still don't fully understand the purposes and uses of nanotechnology yeah, because I mean, at this point, it's still very speculative in that way, right? Um, we we don't actually have a real world case study. Everything, you know, I think the the most sort of well known example would be like Iron Man's nanotech in the Marvel movies or something like that. Um, or certainly, at least among the 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 most um, pertinent ones. And it's interesting, you know. I mean, I, I give him a lot of credit, Gibson, because he's kept up with a lot of trends. I mean, he was born in 1948 and in the 70s, he started kind of writing. um, And then in the 80s, he, you know, wrote his first book, Neuromancer. And uh, that, I mean, if you read Neuromancer, it's like the basis for the matrix, right? Like literally, in fact, they call it jacking into the matrix and stuff like that. So um, that one did have a plot, which is why I was excited to read this one. But um, but also, like, it's interesting, you know, you could, you can you do see how, like, the 60s, because he's a very counterculture type of person, um, did shape him in his worldview. So, yeah, uh, Gibson has, you know, growing up through the 60s and so forth, he has that very anti-capitalist, counterculture type of vibe uh, throughout a lot of his work. But I'm curious if you 
felt that in this one in particular? Um, I wouldn't say from the main character. I can definitely understand where, um, was it, uh, it's not Laney, it's uh, the, the Harwood. Um, Harwood, you know, he he's the, the money behind it. And he, he's the one who's like, like, hey, we have a problem. But I don't ever see like them going to the extremes, the full extremes of that, like, oh, this is what the government actually wants for us. They're, they're forcing this upon us. So like, it doesn't really get too jingoistic in that way. Um, and I didn't see a lot of politics behind it. I saw more of the, the conflict of like, this can't get out to the world and we can't let this happen to people. More so not, not the concept of the government is forcing this upon us so we have to act. Yeah. Um, so I, I didn't see it so much against um, you know, the bureaucratic system. I saw it more as like, we just, we, I see a problem, let's fix it before it gets big. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I certainly felt that as well. I mean, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, there's, again, what it presents is the fascinating side of it. So I think like, if we literally just talked about the themes, um, it would be interesting, but not because we're using the book as, as the platform to talk about those things more. So we would just be talking about those ideas. Right. Um, which is a shame. I mean, as, as we wrap this out, um, it, it, it's a shame because I, I know a lot of people do like this book. And so, you know, I don't want to do a disservice to those people. So if, if you're someone who absolutely enjoys this book, you know, please, like, I know we don't necessarily, but uh, share your thoughts on why, what, what made you gravitate towards it. And I don't know, may, maybe reading it back in 1999 at, at like the height of Y2K, maybe there was some comfort in it. I don't know. <laughs> right. And I mean, and it seems also like writing this book in 99 that, that like, yeah, technology wasn't where it is today. So the height of that technology at the end of 1999 would be like, oh man, we're, we're ahead of our time. Um, the internet was starting to really take off the whole scare of the Y2K. It's like people... We, we were living in a world where people didn't know what the next year was going to be like, or let alone the next 10 years. And so, but because we've been <laughs> past all this and we have that uh, knowledge of what it's like reading it, this book doesn't age well 20 plus years later. It really doesn't. And I think that's also what's working against us because we've seen what technology can do past the year 2006. So... And that was the other thing, like it kept making this a big point of, um, you know, change. And it cited 1911 as the other point of change in human history. And I'm just thinking like, well, what makes 1911 that significant? Because certainly you could look at World War II as a significant event. Certainly you could work, look at, you know what I mean? Like there's just so many points going to the moon is like as far as points of history the, the personal computer, right? Like there's, there's so right. many moments that I could argue that are very historic. And yet at no point does it really like even expand upon the idea that n why 1911 is like the most significant, you know what I mean? Right. And I think the only thing that I can really think about 1911 is like world war one didn't really start till like even a few years after that but it was definitely accumulating at that point so uh, and back then the technology would probably only be like the industrialization of cars and phones phonographs you know I'm just thinking back to the early 1900s like that that was the height of their technology like we can see the transition from automatic items that are helping you know revolutionize the workforce um, but uh, as of technology, you, even stuff back in World War II in the 40s, you know, we, we had the whole Enigma machine that revolutionized how to change the war. Um, so like, so the nanotechnology, I guess you can say, is a pinpoint of the technology back in late 90s that you think could change something, could change the course of an event. Uh, but it really didn't. 
they introduced it, but they yet it didn't do anything to the plot. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. Like, we don't obviously I don't need everything wrapped up, but like just we, we don't even get necessarily a hint at what's coming and how, like, is it ultimately good? Is it ultimately bad? Or can we as an audience make up our minds about that, you know? Um so right. And 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 this drug, this what was it, SB5. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the only thing that I could like really think of or relate to it in our media sense is probably like the, the born identity movies and how medicine can affect a person and you can like uh, militarize them and give them skills and, and like enhances their physical and mental cog- cognitive skills and that way to help you know do whatever in your job and I uh, like and I felt like it was kind of like that and you know born identity came out in like 98 so it's around the same time um but and then i think that's what he was trying to maybe go for it's like this medicine could change um you know this this chemical could change the way that people act and how they you know do and go about their ways but also was it wasn't scary enough for me to realize oh, well, maybe they're like turning into zombies or, or something like cra- crazy to the point where, oh, we have to stop this. Yeah. You know, because we, we, there were two people that were, that used this drug, but they seemed okay. <laughs> like they didn't turn out to be crazy serial killers. Therefore, I didn't see the dire effects of this medicine that we're supposed to be, or like this chemical drug that we're supposed to be afraid of. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly interesting, you know, it- I equated more to like Captain America with like the serum and, you know, not that Laney gay gains uh, super strength, but uh, certainly, you know, he's able to see patterns and things like that. Um, and then, you know, as far as, uh, well, shoot, it was at the uh, top of my mind. I mean, what was I going to say? I, f- I totally blank, but um yeah, I think I think ultimately it it never it never presents what's kind of coming in that way, you know, which is which is a shame, you know. Oh, I was going to say this: um, the writing style, he writes very much in fragments, which is quite like apropos of like what the book ultimately ends up being, because it's never whole, <laughs> just like yeah. his sentences. And I don't mind fragments, but like when every sentence is a fragment, eventually, like that's what makes it hard to like really read, even though it's a short book in terms of page count. Yeah. And that's what I was trying to tell you before we we went live, you know, and we we were texting that like he's very descriptive. I'll give him that. He's very descriptive of like following someone's character movements. This person moved left. This person turned half right. Uh, we walked into this room that looks like this and it's like he's very descriptive in that way and also the way that people feel or think it's very obscure words he's putting together and sure it if it's trying to make you sound interesting and literary i guess you went for it but that doesn't mean it makes sense or that it's good <laughs> and i think the obscure fragments it just felt like a million different pieces reading this book, but fine. If you're going to give me bits and pieces, at least put it together and make a puzzle that makes it a whole story. And right now we're le- we're left reading this book at the end and it still doesn't make sense. Yeah. It's still broken. There's still gaps, visual and mental gaps that doesn't make sense. Wow. So, all right. Well, We've we've uh, bashed the book long enough. Um, <laughs> sadly, uh, I was I was quite hopeful. I, I really was. I was I was really looking forward to this one. It's a shame that it disappointed me, and I apologize for for having dragged you into it. But um, next month, uh, Jane Langton's "The Diamond in the Window." Um, mm-hmm. We're we're as eclectic in our taste. Like we are, we are running the gamut of everything. So we're actually going YA with this one. Um, if you like a wrinkle in time, I think this will be up your alley type of type of thing. Um, so that's what we're, and it's, and it's an easy breezy read. And after uh, not after somewhat of a difficult read, I think this will be a breath of fresh air. 
Oh, for sure. And I, I was actually introduced to this book by a different podcast that I was listening to, and they were going all into it because it's, if you like that adventure, following kids on an adventure of self-discovery and bigger pictureness, you know, it because the book does cover existentialism, which we'll, we'll definitely cover when we actually talk about it. But it's one of those... Uh, adventure books that you're following like not so much following alice through the one you know wonderland and and through the looking glass and all that but it's it's along the same concept of you're following kids on this journey and which is always fun and it's in concord massachusetts so that's a bonus for me yeah there you go (laughs) yeah there you go awesome well one final thing remains tell the people where they can interact with you uh you can follow me everywhere at seraphini tv reading better books than this one (laughs) and i'm at phil svitek thank you so much and we'll see you hopefully next time Mm -hmm.